we started off today with GPU programming, and we're now moving on to compilers. Nice. Um, my name is Franziska Hinkelmann. I'm a software engineer on the Chrome V8 team. I'm also a Node.js core collaborator, and I'll talk about profiling V8. I think we can all agree that JavaScript is incredibly powerful, like not only in what it can do, but also in how fast it can do it. It's amazing that with JavaScript, a scripting language, you can run enterprise node servers, and you can run websites with these huge complex frameworks like a Facebook website or LinkedIn or YouTube and all that with a scripting language. And the performance of JavaScript, or the possibility to run such huge applications with JavaScript, of course, comes down to the JavaScript engines, the virtual machines that take your source code and turn it into an executable machine code, make your website dynamic. Um, so in this talk, we'll look at V8, that's the JavaScript engine in Chrome, and what it does to make JavaScript so fast and how you can profile these optimizations. So to put V8 into context, V8 is not the only JavaScript engine. Um, the, the major browsers all have their own JavaScript engine. We have Chakra Core, that is in Microsoft Edge. You might have heard Kenneth's talk yesterday. We have JavaScript Core in Safari. We have SpiderMonkey and various other monkeys in Firefox. And we have V8 in Chrome. If you're familiar with Node.js, that also runs with a JavaScript engine. Your default node comes with V8, but you can also build it with Jakra Core. Um, Electron, we've heard talks about Electrons and status, Chromium, and Node.js, it has a V8 instance. And then there's other engines that are smaller. If you've heard Yan talks, um, they're, they're very good for IoT devices because they're much, much smaller. They're not as fast as the big ones, but you can fit them on your little microcontrollers. So duct tape or JavaScript are examples there. And in order to talk successfully about, program, about profiling, um, in this talk, we'll look a little bit of some of the internal key concepts of V8. So I'm hoping to give you some insights into this black box, um, what V8 is doing under the hood, how you go from source code to really fast machine code. And I'll show you some, some tools how you can profile V8. So not profile JavaScript on a higher level that would be probably more useful if you want the, the first performance gains, but really down at the low level, compiler level JavaScript engine. Um, the, the tools I'm showing you, on the one hand, they're tools that we use internally at V8. So if we want to make it faster, if we want to figure out why something's slow, what is slow here, those are the tools we use. And then we change V8 internally to make it faster. But of course, you can also use these tools to, compile, uh, to profile your code and maybe make some changes there to gain performance. If you've used the Chrome DevTools, you might have seen there is a profile tab. So you have the console, and you can inspect your HTML and CSS. But there's also a profiles, uh, profile tab where you can record CPU profiles or heap snapshots. And when you do that for JavaScript, or you can also do it for a Node.js server application, um, you, you start your app, you load your website, you start recording, after a while you stop it, and then you, you get a profile of which functions are being run a lot. So I did this here for compiling some TypeScript. Uh, you see which function is spent uh, is the most time being spent on. But one thing you see here, unfortunately, is this little exclamation mark, which of course means some kind of trouble. Um, in this case, the function is related to gets a warning from the profiler saying not optimized. And the reason is optimized too many times. So the next 22 minutes, I want to dig into what does this optimization mean, what are we trying to optimize, and why is this not happening or possible in this case. So um, let's start with some fundamentals, I guess. Um, JavaScript is dynamically typed. It's not statically typed like C++ or, or Java or Rust. It's dynamically typed. That means the types of your variables can change all the time, and the compiler only infers at runtime 
what, what kind of object or type it has. It doesn't know that when it just sees the source code. Um, here's a very simple example. It's an object defined as an object literal. X is 1 and Y is 1. Do you know what the, the properties of this object are? I mean, it's, it's very obvious X and Y clearly are properties, but are they the, on, the only properties? No, this object also gets all the properties of the object prototype. Or if you change the prototype, it would get all the properties of that new prototype. Okay, so we figure out properties are X and Y and everything from the prototype chain. Can the compiler rely on this information? No, because you can at any time delete properties of an object. So this object that you have can change all the time, and only at runtime can the compiler say, yes, it has an X, yes, it has a Y, or not. And of course, you can also add properties. So this type information is not available up front. It's, it's dynamic, and the compiler always has to infer it. And so since JavaScript is dynamically typed, what all the, the Modern JavaScript engines do those that care about performance, so those that we use on the browsers, not necessarily on the smallest IoT devices, is so-called just-in-time compilation. So we compile as we execute the program. In C++, this is very different. If you've ever done any C++, it is clearly ahead of time compilation, because you actually do two separate steps. You first compile it, and you wait a little bit, and then you get an executable that you can run. There's no such thing in JavaScript. You, you just run it. I mean, you might transpile it first, depending what you use, but the, there's no separate compilation step from the execution. But for JavaScript, because we don't have any type information, anything can change all the time, we need to do just-in-time compilation. Um, um, I'm going to look at this example a lot. It's, it's super simple. It's a function that I called load, and all it does is it's accessing a property. You wouldn't even put that in a function usually because it doesn't do much, but it's just return object.x given a parameter x. And obviously, you do property access all the time in JavaScript. Even if you do console.log, console is your object and log is your property. So it's just everywhere. You can't do without property access. And this looks super simple. You have it all the time. It looks very harmless. You know what it does. But if you think about it carefully, what are all the things that could happen here as the return value, or as the compiler tries to get the value object.x? Um, first of all, if you put an undefined as a parameter, it'll throw a type error. Um, the object might not have the property x, so it would be undefined. Or it might be that the object itself doesn't have an own property x, but somewhere up the prototype chain x was defined. So the compiler would have to look up recursively the prototype chain until it finds x. Um, object might be a proxy, so we have to call it the get handler. Um, and x might have been defined in ECMAScript 6 style as an accessor descriptor where you have to call the get function. So you can have any kind of arbitrary side effects. So for the compiler, this very simple object at x is, is a lot of stuff it has to worry about. Um, this is a snippet from the ECMAScript specification. Don't re worry about reading all this, but this is how the ordinary get, is what they call it, is defined. Um, and you can tell this is quite involved for just a tiny little object at x down here. So since we have property accesses everywhere in the program, V8 needs to do a little trick because we can't afford to do these steps every time you do a console.log or any kind of access. So let me show you what you do. So here's the simple load function, and we call it with uh, this very simple object that is just a regular object, no changes on the prototype chain. It has one property x, and it's an integer. So when, we, when the compiler encounters this, this call of load, well, we do implement 
uh, correct ECMAScript, JavaScript, so the compiler has to follow these steps in the specification, which is quite involved, and eventually it figures out, okay, it's a value descriptor, I have to return this value, which is at a certain offset of this object. Okay, so we found object.x, and now what we do is we cache this information. And what we are caching is, we are caching for these kind of objects, this is how you get the value. So we're not caching that specific object and the five. We're caching objects that look exactly like this simple literal in this case. Uh, we know the, the value for x is at a constant offset to our object. So that's some V8 internal that we know where it's stored, but, but we know any object that looks like this, so just one property, it's called x and it's an integer, this is how we get to the value if we need it. And we associate that cache with the call with this property access. So when we later in the program call load again, we're calling it now with a different object. This one has the object x is 17 and not 5, but they look very much the same if you think about the shape of these objects. So when we do this again, and we get to this property access. Um, well, we're, we're being smart now. We check the cache first to see if maybe we have already figured out how to do that. Um, and we realize, yes, we have exactly these kind of objects. We have an entry for objects that look like this in the cache. So let's just get the offset, because that is where that value is. And we for can forget about these 10 steps that otherwise we'd have to do. Okay, and um, these caches, the, the formal name is inline caches. We shortcut them to ICs. So if you ever look at V8 source code, there's a lot of ICs everywhere. Um, you have an, an IC associated to every property access, not to the function or the object, but every single access. So in this case, you have two completely separate inline caches for both these lines, even though it looks the same and is the same function. And what you store in an IC is the keys are shape of objects, and the values are the, the fast path how to get that value. So in our case, we're storing what the object looks like and where to get the 5 or the 17 or whatever x is. And when I say shape of objects, internally we call this map of an object, and sometimes it's also referred to as a hidden class. So since JavaScript doesn't have classes or didn't have classes until ES6, those are very different, we call it, we give objects internally such a hidden internal class. Okay, so this is one way how we speed up V8 to do property accesses faster. Um, that would not be enough yet to have a React framework run in any reasonable time. Um, what, what any modern compiler has these days is at least two compilers, a basic one and an optimizing compiler. In V8, we have actually two optimizing compilers at the moment. They are referred to as crankshaft and turbofan, if you've ever come across that. Um, and so how that works is, when you first run your program, the basic compiler is trying to compile your code very, very fast, um, but to very naive machine code. So it might not be super fast when you, when you first execute it. But after a while, the basic compiler says, well, this function here, that is executed all the time. We should really speed this up into better machine code. So the optimizing compiler takes over and recompiles a so-called hot function into better machine code. So you have more work because you have to recompile again, but you get much, much faster code. So when you run it a lot, it's worth it. And so if you combine optimization with these inline caches, that's where you get a big, big jump in, in speed. Um, okay. So I, I hope you're still with me. It's early. Um, if, if I lost you a little bit, now would be a good time to get back. Um, I'm going to show you now actual machine code for a simple function like that. So think about it. You write JavaScript source code with 
cool frameworks and lots of stuff, and everything's changing all the time. Everybody can put modules up. But when you compile it, you get down to machine code that's basically the same for decades. And I think it's really cool to see how like, the, the high-level stuff, what it ends up with in, in machine code. Um, so just to recap, the JavaScript engines, they compile JavaScript code down to machine code, and I want to show you some machine code now, still for this load example. So this here is optimized machine code for the simple load function that returns object.x. And it might look like a lot. I mean, it's a full page of code. But for like low-level machine code, this is really not much. And I'm going to show you what it actually does. So up here, it says um, call stack check. This is where we enter the function. We just have to make sure we don't have too much recursion, recursion and we can still uh, have space on the stack. So this is where we start the function. The next thing we do is a check non-SMI. So SMI is V8 internal language for small integer. We distinguish between small integers or objects on the heap. Um, anything that's an object must be on the heap. If it's, if it's a SMI, you can't check the hidden class of it or anything. So this is just a, a backup check, basically making sure we, we do deal with some kind of object internally. Um, and now the, what the function should do now is get object.x and return that. So what we do in this optimized piece of machine code is a so-called check maps. And I said map is our word for internal class or the shape of the object. So what this optimized machine code is doing now, it's comparing the two maps of the the parameter that you passed into the function, so that object has a map, it's comparing that to the map that we saved in the inline cache when the basic compiler ran this before. And if those are the same, just like in our example before, if those are the same, then we can do the, the cheap, fast property access, which in this case is a load name field. We know, oh, just load this field at the specific offset and be done with it, return it. Now, if those map checks, if, if we call the load function with an object now that looks very different, then the map check would fail. We don't have the same as that what we had in the cache. And we have to jump when we end up down here, which says de-optimization bailout. So you run your code, you fill your cache, Eventually, you decide, let's make really fast machine code. You use the information from the cache to make this machine code. Like, it's hard-coded in there where it says, check the map at exactly this address. And now, when you're running this code, when you put objects in that are very different from what you are expecting from something you can handle in the inline cache, then you end up in a de-optimization. So that's where the optimizing compiler says, I can handle this, and you go back to the basic slower compiler. OK. So um, I said here we make one map check, because we had exactly one object in our cache, so we only compare to this one object. Um, that's why we distinguish different states of inline caches. So we have, if there's exactly one entry, we call them monomorphic. If there's a handful, like up to four entries, we call it polymorphic, and anything more is megamorphic. And if you, want, if you can, you want your code to have mostly monomorphic or maybe polymorphic caches, but avoid the megamorphic. Um, so here in this example that I just showed you, there was one map check because the cache that we, we assumed the cache was monomorphic. If our cache is polymorphic, and then we generate this optimized code, um, it would look like this, which is exactly the same, except that it has four map checks in there. We would compare against these four entries that we have in the cache. Now, if it's megamorphic, we can't keep going on with all these branches, and we have to do computationally more expensive things. So that's why you want, if possible, always objects of the same shape at the property axes. So same game as before, we're checking if it, comp if it matches one of the entries in the cache, then we can just fast jump and, and return. If it doesn't match any one of them, we're back to this de-optimization. 
Okay, and um, you can actually try all of that. You can just take Chrome that you have anyways, and if you start it from the command line, um, be behind Chrome, just put this flag, uh, dash dash JS flags equals, and then put the V8 flags that you want. So for this case, if you put print opt code, print optimized code, you can also do a print code comments. That gives you exactly this output. So you start Chrome, put this behind it, open a website, and your console will go full with like output like this. Oh, these flags, sorry. Okay. So we care about what the state of the inline caches is. And if you want to dig a little deeper in what's going on in your application, um, we, we have a nice little tool for it, ICE, the IC Explorer, when you, where you can explore the states of your inline caches. Um, you generate the output, like I just said, put the flags behind Chrome, and then load the file here, and you can group your inline caches very nicely by different keys. Um, you really do want to use this tool, not just the editor, because uh, here I was compiling some TypeScript, and it's a million entries. This is uh, very nice if you get this grouped for you. Um, you can sort by different things. Like here, for example, I sorted by code location, and I drilled down on the function that I saw earlier that had the exclamation mark, so I can see exactly, okay, what is happening at the property accesses in this function. So nice little tool to see what are the inline caches doing, because they affect the speed and the optimizations. Um, there's also a, a nice overview if you want to see which functions are actually being optimized by my compiler, and are any functions de-optimized. If you do trace opt and trace de-opt, you get this information. So here, if we run an example that calls load, eventually, if we run it often enough, you'll see optimizing the function load. So the optimizing compiler recompiles it, generates machine code similar to what we just saw. And then if you keep calling it and eventually call it with very different objects, you will see de-optimizing, evicting entry from the code database. So what's, what's happening here is um, in this optimized machine code that I showed you, when the map check didn't work out, we jumped all the way to the bottom and said bailout de-optimization. And um, what V8 is doing here, it's deleting this optimized code because it figured, well, we optimized it, but it doesn't quite work, so we throw it away. We start over with the slow basic compiler for this function again. So you don't want to see this too much when you profile your app because it, it slows it down. So back to this original problem where we saw the exclamation mark warning not optimized, optimized too many times. Um, now we have a better understanding of what's going on here. We have this function is related to. There are things like property accesses in it. We run this function with the basic compiler. We put entries into our inline caches. Um, and eventually, we optimize it using the information from the inline cache. But then we run it with stuff that doesn't match what's in the cache, and we de-optimize it. And then we run it again in a slow compiler. Eventually, we say, oh, let's optimize it again. And then we do this 10 times. And eventually, the compiler says, no point in optimizing this, um, because generating the optimized code, of course, costs performance. Um, let's just not optimize this function anymore. I give up. So this is where this exclamation mark comes from. And so by, by looking at the CPU profile, looking at the inline caches, looking at optimized machine code and also non-optimized code, and looking at the original JavaScript code, it's possible to figure out what kind of changes to make to get rid of this optimization, de-optimization, optimization, de-optimization de thing. So when you make those changes, you profile again, you don't get the exclamation mark anymore. Okay. Um, general warning, as always with optimizations, be very, very careful. Only optimize if you really must, if you have performance problems. And then if you do optimize, make sure you really measure and find your bottlenecks. Don't blindly optimize. Don't say, oh, I've heard something about optimizing compilers. I'm going to start changing because here I can tweak an inline cache or something. Um, you'll just introduce bugs and make your code really hard to maintain. That's just the, the usual optimization. Um, 
But in this case specifically, I would almost advise against optimizing for things like that, because those are V8 internals. They're not agreed upon by the ECMAScript committee to be like this. Um, and they change internally. Like Every commit that we make, every Canary version you get every night, things might have changed. Um, we might have figured a better way to do something. So when you did micro-optimizations for something that is true today, it might actually be negatively affecting your performance tomorrow. And then obviously, it's just V8. The other JavaScript engines work very differently. So if you write your JavaScript code in a specific way, then they're only faster in this one engine, but probably not in the other engines. So I, I hope I was able to give you a little bit of an insight into this black box of JavaScript engines, what they do from source code to really fast machine code. If you want to play with any of this yourself and see what are, what's my app doing in general or what are little code snippets doing, um, you can always just use Chrome, start it from the command line, do dash dash js flags equals. And then some things we looked at was uh, trace opt, trace deopt, print opt code, or uh, trace ic. If you're familiar with Node, you can also um, start a Node server and put the V8 flags there, just put them right behind Node. And if you are more adventurous, you can compile V8 yourself and get D8, that is the V8 debugging shell, and run that with all the flags. Um, if you use D8, you have the advantage that you don't get the overhead of things that happen in the browser or things that happen in Node before your function actually starts up. And if you want to explore your inline caches, the IC Explorer is distributed with the V8 source code. There's a link to it. Um, if you have any questions or feedback or performance questions, uh, please find me during the breaks. And feel free to reach out with Twitter or email. Thank you.